looking out for number one, how to get from where you are now to where you want to be in life by Robert Ringer. This book is in the public domain. We continue now on with chapter three, the intimidation hurdle. Without being consciously aware of it, a large percentage of our day-to-day actions are motivated by fear. For example, you can be motivated by the fear of physical harm, the fear of losing a business deal, or the fear of being embarrassed. While such fears may sometimes be well-founded, often they are just a result of being intimidated because intimidation is motivation through fear. In order to recognize when you're being intimidated, you have to familiarize yourself with the many ways in which intimidation is camouflaged. Whenever you suspect that you might have inadvertently gotten trapped into playing the role of the intimidatee, ask yourself a simple question. Why am I doing what I am doing? If you can trace the reason for your actions to motivation through fear, no matter how subtle it may be, then intimidation is the culprit. All too often, we react like Pavlovian dogs and obey the commands of others without stopping to analyze why. Actions based on intimidation can become such an accepted mode of behavior that we reach a point where we don't even recognize the true source of our motivation. Of course, there will always be self-righteous, professional halo wearers who become indignant at the mere mention of the word intimidation. Whenever you run into such holier-than-thou characters, you should be vigilant about refusing to allow them to throw you off guard. It's been my experience that those who protest the loudest about the evils of intimidation are the very people who most frequently employ it. Given that human beings are masters of self-delusion, many high-level intimidators sincerely believe they are saints. But whether or not someone admits, even to himself, that he uses intimidation as a tool is irrelevant. If the shoe fits, it fits. Intimidation through wealth. Wealth can give an otherwise inept person a strong, even overwhelming, posture. To psychologically defend yourself against such a person, you should keep in mind that another individual's net worth does not dilute your own intrinsic value. Money should be respected but not overrated. Make the other person come up with something more than a good balance sheet before conceding an inch of ground to him. There is no requirement for you to grant him permission to have power over you. What you bring to the table could very well be worth far more than the other guy's money. Intimidation through credentials what is an expert? All too often, he's just someone who can tell you all the reasons why you can't do something. Personally, I prefer to discover for myself what I am or am not capable of accomplishing. Sometimes an expert is nothing more than an ordinary guy from out of town who knows his job. I have always marveled at how an individual's expert status seems to increase in direct proportion to the distance between his current place of residence and his hometown. The printed word helps to create experts too. For years I was saying many of the same things I now write about in books, but I didn't attract too many listeners. I don't want to make you feel bad, but if you had been around me during those times, You could have gotten most of the information in this book for free. In fact, I probably would have treated you to lunch just for listening to me. Some years ago, 
a director and an instructor in psychiatry, both from the University of Southern California Medical School, teamed up with an assistant professor of medical education at Southern Illinois University to conduct an unusual experiment. They arranged to have a Dr. Myron L. Fox, purportedly an authority on the application of mathematics to human behavior, speak to a group of 55 educators, school administrators, psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers. His topic was mathematical game theory as applied to physician education. 42 of the 55 people in attendance agreed that the speaker's examples helped to clarify the subject and that the material was well organized and the lecture stimulating, which was fine, except for the fact that Dr. Fox was a hired actor and his lecture was never meant to be anything but pure double talk. At best, Experts are people who are knowledgeable in their fields, knowledgeable but not infallible, and the best ones will openly admit it. As specialists, they tend to suffer from myopia. To paraphrase the great logotherapist Viktor Frankl, an expert is often nothing more than a person who cannot see the forest of truth for the trees of facts. The certificate. An expert with a certificate on his wall is in a strong position to be an intimidator, but only if you allow yourself to become enamored by his expert credentials. Just because someone has a license from the government, a university, or any other institution that allows him to practice his profession without having to worry about unlicensed competition, a phenomenon known in organized crime as protection racket, doesn't mean he has all the answers. No diploma, license, or other piece of paper can take the place of knowledge and ability. In this regard, your attitude toward self-anointed experts should be, don't try to overwhelm me with your diplomas or years of experience. Instead, Impress me with your knowledge and demonstrable results. If you're accustomed to checking out a person's certification, credentials for confirmation of his expertise, particularly if his only credential is a piece of paper issued by some bureaucratic institution, best you break that habit as quickly as possible. Then get in the habit of checking a person's premises when he speaks. If his premises are sound, only then does it make sense to consider, not blindly accept, what he has to say? A classic example of intimidating credentials can be seen in medical doctors. Is there anything more irritating than a doctor who rushes you through your examination, talks down to you, and gives you flip answers? If you remain in a relationship with such a doctor, it can lead to serious consequences not the least of which is unnecessary surgery. Never agree to undergo an invasive procedure without first obtaining at least one other professional opinion. If that hurts your doctor's feelings, he's the wrong doctor for you. Your doctor may have good intentions every time someone walks through his office door, but the reality is that he isn't as concerned about your welfare as you are. He might be the most ethical and qualified physician in the world, but the fact is that you are just one of many patients he sees every day. He may be a medical doctor, but he's also human, which makes it impossible for him to have the same degree of interest in your health as you do. Never forget that in your life, you are the main event. And if you lose the main event, you don't get another chance. True, you can't take matters completely into your own hands when it comes to medicine because you obviously can't perform surgery on yourself. But there is nothing to stop you from obtaining a second or even third qualified opinion when a doctor hands down an ominous diagnosis. 
because doctors are human. They're entitled to make mistakes. Just make certain that you don't end up being on the wrong end of one of the more serious mistakes your doctor may make. If you aren't vigilant in this area, looking out for number one can quickly become a moot point. If you haven't already done so, it would be much to your benefit to develop the self-discipline to avoid making decisions based solely on the opinion of purported experts. By all means, listen to what the experts have to say, but be certain to weigh what you hear against all other available evidence. Above all, weigh it against your reasoning power, then make decisions accordingly. Whenever you start to relapse into allowing yourself to be intimidated by experts, remember that the great Greek philosopher Aristotle once insisted that the Earth was the center of the universe and that seven planets, which he believed included the Sun and the Moon, revolved around it. Based on scientific knowledge available at that time, his pronouncements were perfectly reasonable. The problem is that new evidence in virtually every field emerges almost daily, which all too often makes last year's experts look rather foolish. Hey, if you can't trust Aristotle, who can you trust? The good news is that no expert can hold your mind captive against your will. Intimidation through custom and tradition. Intimidation through custom and tradition can affect many areas of a person's life and play havoc with his reasoning powers. It runs the gamut from law and religion to protocol at social gatherings to the proper setting of a dinner table. Human beings have been known to be a bit overzealous when it comes to protecting the status quo. In the strictest sense of the word, most people are conservative in that they lean toward preserving existing conditions, feeling safer with established customs. This ingrained fear of change can cause people to resort to their irrational worst in defense of their protected monopolies. When it comes to custom and tradition, people tend to spend a great deal of time and energy doing things for which they hope to be appreciated. It's nice when it happens, but it's a big mistake to base your actions on the desire to gain the gratitude of others, as spelled out in the you won't get credit for it theory, which states, never do anything with the expectation of being appreciated. The most valid reason for taking an action is that you sincerely want to do it. Often, when we yield to peer or societal pressure and do something just because it's the right thing to do, we are surprised and disappointed to discover that people not only do not appreciate what we've done, but may even dislike us for it. A good example of this is when you begrudgingly tip a waiter who has given you bad service. Because it's an established custom to leave tips in restaurants, when a waiter serves you cold food, makes you wait 20 minutes for a glass of water, and snarls at you for asking a question, you may find yourself torn over whether or not to leave him a tip. Unfortunately, notwithstanding such terrible service, the fear of feeling embarrassed might overrule your reasoning powers and motivate you to leave a tip anyway. But in an attempt to file at least a mild protest against the waiter, you decide to tip him a little less than the standard 15-20%. Zap! Custom and tradition has intimidated you into making an irrational decision for which you won't get credit. Instead, what you will get is a triple loss. One, you didn't enjoy your meal because of the bad service. Two, the waiter scorns you for leaving him less of a tip than he expected and insult of insults may even disrespect you for not having the courage to refuse to tip him at all. And three, you're out of the money you did leave him as a tip. 
in the ancient language of hieroglyphics, your what is commonly known as a J-E-R-K. But take heart. If you dine out often enough, the money you save in tips during the next year alone as a result of employing the you won't get credit for it theory should pay for the cost of this book many times over. Common sense tells us that if a belief was irrational or immoral when it first came into existence, it doesn't become any more rational or moral with the passage of time. The seniority of a custom bears no relationship whatsoever to its rational or moral validity. Those who revere long-standing customs merely because of their entrenchment are living their lives on shaky ground, morally, philosophically, and rationally. If an established practice works well for you and does not harm others, that's fine. But practices that have no basis in fact, whose premises rest on quicksand, should be discarded. If past ideas contradict reality, logic, or current circumstances, they should be abandoned without ceremony. It takes nothing more than common sense and courage to eliminate long-standing, irrational customs or traditions. Since looking out for number one requires an awareness of what you're doing and why you're doing it, it's incumbent upon you to rid yourself of customs and traditions that are either irrational, immoral, or both. Regardless of how old or how well accepted a custom or tradition may be, it is obliged to stand the test of time and changing circumstances. Intimidation through conformity Intimidation through conformity is a first cousin to intimidation through custom and tradition. When you're intimidated into going along with a new fad, a new idea that has gained wide acceptance, or the latest in thing, you are conforming. Whenever you find yourself doing something just because everybody else is doing it, your action is motivated by the fear of standing apart from the herd. As every concerned parent knows, teenagers are especially prone to such misguided actions. Just because something is in vogue doesn't mean it good or bad. It only means that more people are doing it, wearing it, or saying it. But if you rationally decide upon a different course of action, that doesn't make you inferior, stupid, or weird. All it means is that you're comfortable enough with who you are to base your actions on your own independent thinking. The Thousand Duplets Speaking of standing apart from the herd, in the 70s, when I was single and living in Los Angeles, I once took a drive down to Manhattan Beach to survey the social situation I had heard so much about. As I trudged across the sand toward one of the volleyball nets, vigorously sucking my thumb and performing dazzling loop-the-loops with my yo-yo, I became puzzled. It was like a weird dream, as though I had landed on a faraway planet. There, in Manhattan Beach, I saw them. The thousand duplets. It seemed like there were a thousand identical twins standing around with cans of Bud Light in their right hands. Each of the thousand duplets was tall and displayed six-pack abs, a dark tan, and well-coiffed bleached blonde hair. Cocked at just the right angle at the front of their blonde mops were sunglasses, the kind no one ever wears over their eyes. It wasn't a commercial. It was real life. These guys were actually concentrating on assuming cool poses and, of course, making sure their sunglasses didn't fall off. And the girls around them were neither pretty nor smiling like the ones you see in those TV ads. I found the scene to be not only perplexing, but depressing. Even if I were able to balance a pair of sunglasses at the top of my forehead, I could never hope to fit in. My hair wasn't blonde, my stomach wasn't flat and ripped, I didn't drink beer, and there was no way I could ever tan my tortoise shell. As I made my way back to my car, 
I looked over my shoulder to catch one last glimpse of the thousand tubelets. Did a final loop-the-loop -loop with my yo-yo and thought to myself, amazing, really amazing. What an anonymous life, that of the thousand duplet. Many unanswered questions still haunt me. Like, what kind of woman gave birth to a thousand boys? How do they know they're in the right apartment at night? And if their sunglasses should fall off and break, are they exiled to Redondo Beach? If reality TV had been in vogue back then, I'm convinced I could have sold the idea to one of the major networks. I can see it now. The trials and tribulations of the thousand duplets. Each week, one bikini-clad movie star wannabe would have romantic interludes with a number of thousand duplets, then ultimately pick the one she believed had the most awesome abs, the darkest tan, the blondest, best coiffed hair, and the biggest unemployment check. The herd instinct in all of us makes conforming feel natural. But the fact is that conforming may not be in your long-term best interest. With time, you will discover that people will admire you more for having the courage to do what you think is right, even though they may chide or admonish you in the short term. Any parent who can get a teenager to understand this reality deserves to be in the Parent Hall of Fame. Tenaciously resist the inclination to do something just because it's in style. While it may seem like the easiest thing to do at the time, it can be far too costly over the long term. Conforming as the channel of least resistance can carry a heavy price tag, the loss of one's self-respect. Intimidation through slogan. By slogan, I am referring to any phrase, saying, or adage new or old, intended to effect a knee-jerk response from listeners. Whether the intended purpose of the slogan is good or bad by your standards, a slogan is irrational to the extent one tries to use it as a basis for getting others to stop doing something they are doing or to do something they don't want to do. Slogans are an effective tool for keeping others in line especially when used by absolute moralists. Consider such slogans as War is peace Freedom is slavery Ignorance is strength You may recognize the above words as Big Brother's slogan in George Orwell's all-too-real novel 1984. It is intended to be the definitive irrational slogan. Orwell was making the point that people can be made to believe just about anything if they hear it often enough. Though slogans backed by traditional government force, all citizens in 1984 are kept in line, conforming to the point where they are virtually mindless, ready to accept any slogan as a fact. In real life, doublespeak is a powerful tool used by governments to convince the masses that hell is paradise via a never-ending stream of clouded and twisted phrases and slogans such as shared prosperity, the good of society, and fair share. Governments are masters of intimidation through slogan, and they have the money, the manpower, and if needed, the guns to back up their slogans. The bottom line is that you should never allow yourself to be intimidated by a slogan. A slogan of and by itself is not a valid reason for taking action, particularly if such action results in pain or discomfort. More often than not, the real purpose of a slogan is to try to intimidate you into helping the slogan maker advance his own agenda. Be vigilant about not buying into it. A rational person bases his behavior on facts. 
intimidation through guilt. Guilt is a state of mind you need not endure. Within the boundaries of a generally accepted code of conduct, you and you alone must decide what is right and wrong for you. And once you've done so, there is no reason to feel guilty for acting in a manner considered improper by someone else's standards. In this regard, beware the absolute moralist, the shameless meddler we unmask in chapter 1. Because he is convinced that his view of morality is right for everyone. The absolute moralist is able to justify just about any action he deems necessary to convert others to his beliefs. Consequently, he shackles himself with no restraints when it comes to meddling in the lives of others. The absolute moralist is a master at inducing guilt feelings aimed at intimidating people into seeing things his way. Self-righteous individuals are also master guilt inducers. All absolute moralists are self-righteous people, but not all self-righteous people are absolute moralists. Those who are obsessively focused on claiming the moral high ground possess monstrous egos. However, what you see and what you get when dealing with a self-righteous person can be quite different. Be wary of the individual who states his virtuous case in such a way as to make you feel guilty for not being up to his moral standards. There is no end to the number of guilt games people play. Given an opening, there are individuals who will gladly criticize and blame you for everything from losing their jobs to passing up opportunities for better jobs. Overcoming the fear of being condemned for refusing to do what others want you to do requires a great deal of self-discipline. Never accept a responsibility just because someone thinks you should. An important step in clearing the intimidation hurdle is to understand the wisdom contained in the no theory, which states, learn to say no politely and pleasantly, but immediately and firmly. Simple to say, but often difficult to do. Again, morality is a very personal matter and, as such, you should not allow others to decide your moral code for you. Make the foundational decisions regarding your own moral standards. Then refuse to allow another person's opinion on the subject to evoke feelings of guilt. Because that's just what it will be. Someone else's opinion. Also, don't be so willing to accept criticism and blame. And whether or not it's justified, don't waste time feeling guilty about it. If you engage in behavior that you later decide was wrong by your standards, guilt is not the solution. Instead, make the necessary apology in a straightforward manner, one time, then forget about it. On the other hand, if you're not guilty, skip the apology and just forget about it. You are a human being, and as such, you should accept the fact that, like everyone else on this planet, you sometimes make mistakes. Even if your mistake can be classified as major, feeling guilty about it will do absolutely nothing to rectify the situation. By all means, strive to learn from your mistake, then let go of it and pledge to be vigilant about not repeating it. You have no need to feel guilty for looking out for number one, and to the extent you allow other people to sap your energy by engendering guilt, you will be moving away from that noble objective. Also, Don't forget that it cuts both ways, so make certain you do not attempt to induce guilt feelings in others. Intimidation through slander If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you don't understand your accuser's neurosis, slander can be a very intimidating tool. Since 
all human beings possess, to varying degrees, such negative traits as jealousy, envy, hatred, and cruelty, slander is widely used for venting emotions. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, when someone tries to twist your words, change your meanings, or restate your intentions, you may instinctively feel like lashing out and defending yourself. There's a natural inclination to want to prove to the world that what has been said about you is false. Everything else becomes secondary to righting the terrible wrong that has been committed against you. And once your emotions reach that point, The slander has won. Why would someone have a desire to slander you? There could be any number of reasons. He may envy you because of your achievements. He may be frustrated over his own low station in life. Or he may be unfortunate enough to possess such traits as envy and or cruelty to an excessive degree. Whatever his reasons. The moment you begin analyzing your critic's intentions, you've already taken a step in the wrong direction. Recognize that it's his problem, not yours. Then simply ignore his remarks. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. Hatred can be jarring to an individual who generally minds his own business and is focused on his own affairs. There is so much bitterness in our world due to feelings of inadequacy, guilt, and failure, not to mention perceived self-sacrifice, that the neurotic individual often feels that he can vent his frustration only through hatred. Or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Perhaps the most difficult type of slander to swallow is the outright lie. It's like being shocked with a cattle prod. When it strikes, it throws you off balance, often leaving you stunned and speechless. What is most difficult about an out-and-out lie is the depressing reality that there will always be some people who will believe it and others who will at least partially believe it. The tendency to give credence to even the most outrageous lie is based on the old adage that when there's smoke, there's fire, which is precisely what makes a slander such an effective weapon. Fortunately, the effects of a lie are usually short-lived, even among irrational people, provided you don't make the mistake of helping to keep the lie in the spotlight. The less you say, the better, because rational people view a lie in the same way they view any other kind of statement not supported by facts. The reality is that you are going to be slandered from time to time, so you shouldn't allow it to throw you into a state of emotional turmoil when it happens. If you feel the necessity to defend yourself against a lie, the best approach is to first give yourself time to cool off and think the matter through rationally. During the cooling off period, try your best to analyze the facts with a dispassionate mindset. Then, after you've thought it through carefully, state your defense clearly, simply, and firmly, but only to those whose opinions you value. Avoid nasty adjectives and broad sweeping statements that only succeed in discrediting you. Skip the extraneous and forego repetition. The destruction of the lie in the eyes of those you care about will very much depend on how you handle the matter. It's not a matter of turning the other cheek. It's a matter of doing what's in your best interest. To feel compelled to expose a lie to every person you come across is counterproductive. In any event, an overly vehement defense rarely convinces others that the slander is not true. On the contrary, the louder the protests, the more suspicious it tends to make people. 
An important rule to remember when dealing with people in all areas of life is the power of the understatement is enormous. Intimidation through grouping and tagging. Human beings have a habit of creating fictitious entities to describe large numbers of individuals. Government, the people, and society are classic examples of this. They are abstract terms that refer to groups of people and groups do not have qualities. Only people do. So, while every individual within a group possesses human traits, the group itself does not. When you stamp a person with a group label or tag, you not only are being unfair to him, but to yourself. You are cheating yourself of what that person, as a unique human being, has to offer. Tagging people is a convenient tool that makes it easier to indulge irrational hatreds. When you combine bigotry with slander, you have the most irrational and dangerous of all weapons. Those who suffer from a lack of self-esteem need scapegoats, because if they can vent their anger on others, they need not search within for the true cause of their lack of self-esteem. There has always been prejudice in the world, and you can be certain there always will be. The word barbarian has been traced all the way back to Sanskrit, where it translates as stammerer. The idea was that if a person didn't speak your language and act like you, he was a stammerer, an ignoramus. Since there wasn't much contact in the early centuries between races, most bigotry was based on religion. You weren't a man, you were a Jew, a Christian, or a heathen. Then again, you may have been a woman, which automatically saddled you with a number of traits you may not have possessed. Aristotle insisted that women had inconclusive reasoning powers and that their nature was, for the most part, inferior. In his judgment, a man would be thought a coward who had no more courage than a courageous woman. As centuries passed and the world grew smaller, the opportunities for coming in contact with human beings with a different physical characteristic increased. And though millions of people still clung to irrational methods of grouping and tagging, the phenomenon of differing skin coloring made scapegoating much easier, especially for people with feelings of inferiority. As early as 1758, Carl von Linn, the famous Swedish botanist, made the characteristic of all black people accepted scientific fact. In working out a system of classifying every known living being, which actually became a cornerstone for modern biology, Lynn scientifically described the black African as crafty, indolent, negligent, and governed by caprice. With science on its side, racism gained an air of respectability. Later, in the United States, all sorts of irrational actions continued to reaffirm Lynn's scientific judgment. In 1857, Chief Justice Taney of the Supreme Court, in handing down the famed Dred Scott decision, reasoned that a black person has no rights which a white man need respect. Abraham Lincoln, in one of his well-publicized debates with Stephen Douglas, stated, I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. There must be the position of superior and inferior, and I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. But this kind of grouping wasn't reserved for blacks. If you were different from the majority of the population, you qualified as a faceless, brainless member of a group. 
President Theodore Roosevelt once exclaimed, I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indians are dead Indians, but I believe nine out of every ten are, and I shouldn't inquire too closely into the case of the tenth. The most vicious cowboy has more moral principle than the average Indian. While it's fine to be proud of your heritage, you should also recognize that you had nothing to do with the actions of your ancestors. In fact, you never even knew them. What your ancestors accomplished is no feather in your cap, nor should you feel responsible for their sins. The real issue is how you live your life and what you have accomplished. Be proud of who you are. If your great-grandfather was a rapist or horse thief, that would not affect my opinion of you. Of course, if he was a criminal defense attorney, that might be another matter. Make it a point never to take an irrational stand against someone because of his race, religion, or any other irrelevant characteristic out of fear that you may not be accepted by your peers. If your peers don't accept those who refuse to play the grouping and tagging game, the solution is not to appease them, but to find new peers. Don't be intimidated by those who would try to place you in a cookie cutter category and make certain that you are never guilty of grouping or tagging others. Exercising Invalid Fears The various kinds of intimidation I have discussed in this chapter are but a small sampling of the ways in which people can be motivated to take action through fear. Some fears are valid, but most are not. And it's the invalid fears that should be exorcised from your life. And the key to accomplishing that is to constantly ask yourself the question, why am I doing what I'm doing? Whenever the answer is fear, the second step is to analyze whether or not your fear is valid. If so, example, someone might literally be holding a gun to your head, by all means, do what needs to be done to make the best of a bad situation, but nothing more, i.e., keep your emotions under control. But if your fear is irrational, shift gears and employ your intellect to decide on a correct course of action. You've crossed the intimidation hurdle when you are able to make such course corrections quickly and consistently. End of chapter three. All right, if you haven't done so, dear one, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and let's head over to the next video where we're going to learn about the crusade hurdle.